The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You guys should realize right now that most of uh, when people start discussing the Bible, then it turns scientific. Have you guys noticed that? It turns into a scientific conversation. Very seldom does it remain in that realm of faith. But it turns into science and proof and facts and data, more science and proof and facts and data. That's what it turns into. The other part of that is that people build people up saying that no matter what you do, you're going to prosper, you're going to do this and do that. And then, of course, when a person has to go through a trial or tribulation, they feel like the world ended because nobody warned them that they would have to go through trials and tribulations. So it's not normal to a person to go through trials and tribulations. And when it's not normal, it feels like you're being attacked or assaulted. Then kind of shake up your faith. If you knew that it was normal for your faith to be tried, in all types of areas of your lives, you probably would not be moved in certain events, and you would be able to discern which things are trials and which things are for other reasons. Most things in my life I have caused. It's not like the Lord sent them. I did that stuff. And so things the Lord said, we're gonna we're gonna reap what we sow. There are things I've done that I've had to sow. They came back, I didn't blame that on Satan at all. It was me. I don't expect to get away with anything. So accountability is very important. That's part of truth itself. Once you face that, you can clearly see the trials in your life and you'll handle your issues differently. You believe in Christ, right? You guys believe in Christ. You can't believe in Christ unless you're a partaker of the comforter. So then by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have your faith, a measure of faith, that's your connection. That's why faith is spoken about so much. That's why it's so strong. And if you were to ever walk into that and walk by that, then you would certainly see more than you ever thought you would see. Conviction comes with what our brains know by way of the Holy Spirit, by way of truth, right? That's where conviction comes from. It's when you know something and you don't know how you know it, it's the first time you ever did something and something says, don't do that. Don't get into that. That's truth. That truth operates by way of the Holy Spirit that's poured out on who? All flesh. Not some flesh. All flesh. So you have your father and out of your father came what? The word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among men. So Christ is what? God's word. And you have the Holy Spirit, which is what? The Spirit poured out on all flesh. You guys know what the confusion part is? There was a doctrine that was given out by the Catholics. I'm not against Catholics out there, right? Telling you about the doctrine that they apologized for. And what they did was they had an edict that said it needs to be three separate individuals and that they had a right to do that because they were the interpreters on this earth of everything God had. It's the same reason why a person would ask a priest to forgive them. And the Lord said, call no man father. That's what he said. You have one father. Call no man father. Christ has power to forgive. But during the days when the Vatican or, or the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church seized power from Rome and became that voice of authority of government in the world, they changed a lot. Now, they can't just up and tell everybody that, but they did write letters of apology. You guys should go get them and look at them. They're indisputable. They tell you exactly what they did, exactly what they assumed, and the apology is right there. But for the sake of all the people and that ingrained belief, they don't speak openly of those apologies, but they are printed. They can be found. You can print a copy and look at it all day long if you want to. That type of teaching of which men broke away from, those were hard days during the time of that verdict wave because they also believed that they had to interpret scripture and that it was illegal for any individual to interpret scripture. That's how they operate. So when you start breaking that down, people have this argument of three not realizing that God is God. God is also spirit. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, which means then God is the word he speaks. So God is the word. God is most certainly his spirit, but they are all God. All exist within him. See how foolish the argument becomes? It becomes redundant and foolish. Because if all of them came from the Father in the first place, why would people ever argue about those entities? That's not an argument. That's a seed sown from Satan. Another topic of division where Satan does not have you look at the root of how everything began or the constructive basis of all elements. 
but would have people argue over the elements. And don't you think that would be an abomination to the Most High? I do. I think that would be an abomination. In fact, when I hear people argue about that, if they could just hear what they're saying, one person will say, no, there are three individuals. No, they're one. Don't they hear what they're saying? Because out of one came the three, and the three are nothing without the one. Don't they hear it? My goodness. So, people, they sometimes argue things that are baseless. That's an argument for the sake of argument. Well, just like the rapture. Can you imagine a person who died 17 years ago? Suppose they were in an argument about the rapture. They said, nope, I'm going to be with the Lord and he's coming soon. Well, for them, he did. He's coming for all of us because we all have an expiration date. But I want you guys to look at this argument. Most people argue he's coming to get us all at one time. Are they forgetting that people die every single day? What's the point of that argument? Because today, somebody's rapture is going to happen, right? Today, somebody's departing. Satan loves for us to argue these points. Because if we do that, we won't look at the substance of the entire conversation and how it is a blessing to have that hope. Do you know what it says in Thessalonians? Talking about Jesus coming, it, you know, when, when those of us who are alive at a specific time, how that we will be caught up in the air and forever be with the Lord. Do you know what it says? It says comfort each other with these words. Now, why would that be in there? Comfort one another with these words. Here we have again, right, because that will build a hope. That builds hope. It's like running. If you're running a marathon, but there's no finish line, I don't think you're going to run that marathon too much longer because it would not be a marathon. If there's no completion, there's no hope. But if there is completion, there is hope. To comfort each other with the words that was, that was spoken in Thessalonians shouldn't be tied to this ideology, but tied to the whole thing. And what I mean by that is this. If somebody is following the Lord simply so they can escape, then they're not going to stand before the Lord and be accepted naturally because that's what people do in the world they act a certain way to get what they want and when they get what they want they change they act like something else well god already knows what we are on the inside but to have a hope and to say our time is coming soon is actually a truth and it didn't matter if the lord comes in ten thousand years because you're not going to be here ten thousand years there's an expiration date on all of us and we forget about that don't we that we could go at any time, that no man is promised tomorrow. Don't we forget about that. That means at any given moment, it could be your time. See, people argue. They're arguing about when everybody's leaving. And they're not paying attention to the fact that in five minutes, somebody will most certainly leave. They're not paying attention to that. How many people die every single day? They're passing. They're translating every single day, every single hour of every single day. They're going. They're leaving. Isn't that something? But see, we have this mindset. It's the same reason why people are frightened of death. They don't like that conversation of death. Because as a Christian, why would a Christian believe in death? There is no death to a Christian. There is a process and a transition. There is no death. There's no such thing. It's just like me. That's why I don't throw up the funerals. Because I know better. I can't cry at a funeral like the person is gone and I won't see him again. Because that would be a lie. I'd be crying over a lie. People can cry because they'll miss someone. I can totally see that. But to say you won't ever see somebody again is to believe the world's doctrine. That there is no resurrection. That there is no transition. And I'm not one to live my life. 50-50. I'm, I'm not, you know, like coffee with creamer and then the other half is coffee. No, no, no 50-50 for me. But we've gotten so used to having these sayings and these responses. What we don't know is that that can destroy our faith. Because at the root of us, at the core of us, we always voice our own issues with our faith. And if we were to pay attention to what we were saying regarding these issues, that's where we can make corrections. And we wouldn't be weak in any situation. Weak because we don't believe. We get weak because our faith is that from time to time. When people get in trouble, they'll say, I wonder if the Lord really loves me. If we get real sick and we don't want to be sick or we have high states of pain, that's one of the first things we say. I wonder why the Lord is allowing me to go through this. Why is this happening to me? It's been going on for too long. I wonder if the Lord loves me. And it's due to a lack of knowledge. Because if we continue on that track, we are certainly destroyed. Also in Revelation, people hate God. How do you think they got that way? Many of those people who hated God are the ones who fell away, aren't they? Like an atheist. Why would an atheist who does not believe in God spend all their life writing about how they don't believe in God? Anybody answer that? Who would invest all their time and energy and effort and writing about something they don't believe in. I don't believe in the state puff marshmallow man. 
So I'm not talking about them or writing books about them. You guys get the point. But do you see these weapons of Satan? Do you see what Satan is actually doing? Can you discern the contention in the body of Christ because of these subjects? You can't even talk about the rapture. You can't go into people's chat rooms and talk about the rapture because it's going to be the same argument. Because they don't like the word, or they don't like this, or that's not true. And then they'll say, well, you really need salvation. Or if you, if, if you say you don't believe in the rapture, they'll say, well, that person isn't, it doesn't believe in Christ. No, that's not what that means. It means they're not sure about the concepts. When we say we don't believe in something like that, that that's simply from a person who's not sure about the concept. There's no argument should be had there. Because again, we forget that somebody is dying today. People die every single day. And sure enough, in the Bible, it says those who are alive at the time will meet the Lord in the air, not on the ground, and said in the air. And they will forever be with the Lord. They'll meet him in the air. So to be sober about that, to give context to that, is not to sit in your chair and wait for that time to come. No. And see, that's why I asked, did anybody read Thessalonians lately? Because you know what Thessalonians really talks about? About how we are to be prepared before the Lord comes back. How we are to be purged of sin before the Lord comes back. Uh-oh, that's what it talks about. How we are to have overcome darkness before the Lord comes back. See? Now, how many of you have heard that before? That's what Thessalonians talks about. That we are supposed to be at a specific level when the Lord comes back. How many of you have read that? But the main discussion when you start talking about Thessalonians is either the beast or the rapture. Never about how we are supposed to have overcome this darkness and sin in the world. See, in the Bible, it says that Jesus can keep us from falling, that we are to reach a point where we're not even involved in sin anymore. But how many are telling anybody that? Now, if the Lord comes back and we're still involved in sin, is there something in Thessalonians that says something about that? You better believe it, and it is not nice. When Satan starts these arguments of division, he takes your mind away from repentance. He takes your mind away from the true task at hand, which is to become a child of the living God, which is to overcome your sin, which is to reach that redemption factor. That's why Jesus said, when you see these things start to come to pass, look up and lift up your head. For what? For your redemption draweth nigh. You know what that means? Your redemption is incomplete until he returns. He specifically said also those that endure until the end, the same shall be saved. What end? Your end. And then you have people getting bored. How could I get bored if I haven't worked out certain areas of darkness in my life? How in the world could I ever be complacent if I know for a fact I'm complicit or still practicing certain things in sin? You see what's happening. Satan can get you into a debate or an argument. He will disgust you with certain scriptures and books. And every single subject that he emphasizes for the sake of an argument, you better believe it's telling you to work out your salvation, to get away from sin, to truly repent. It's giving you a task that Jesus expects when he arrives. Do you guys see how that works? Do you see what Satan is doing? And if you engage in these arguments, you're not thinking about repentance. You're defending your own position. And he's destroying people left and right. And he's gaining power on this earth. For a long time, since I was young, I used to wonder, how can a beast rise? If a lot of people believe in Christ, that would be impossible. At the very presence of the saints, Satan would have to fold up and go somewhere else. So who's giving him room to rise in the first place? How can a beast come forward in the presence of the Holy Spirit when it occupies vessels of believers all throughout the earth? How could that ever happen? It becomes more and more evident, more and more evident. See, Satan cannot occupy a space with the Holy Spirit. Demons cannot function in an area where the Holy Spirit is. Can't do it. And their sole purpose is to try to get you to give up on your faith. That's part of a very real war. That's why they work very hard to keep you away from everybody else. Do you guys know that? That's one of Satan's most effective tactics. To keep you away from everybody else. To keep you away from sinners is one of his most effective tactics. To make Christians divide so that in unity they never gain ground. To isolate you. And then he works through your loved ones. To keep them away from you and to keep you away from them. He causes an offense so that you two are never together. Do you know why? Because God placed you where he placed you. Because he put something in you just for those people around you. Satan knows that. Satan does not go after someone who has no light in them. 
I hope you know that. Satan will never attempt to separate anybody who will not affect change in another. And it's Satan's work when he divides people. That's purely Satan and his tactics. And he'll use anything to do it. He'll do everything he can do to keep you away from everybody else. See, so long as you're not in the mix, they can have all sorts of doctrines in the world, and hardly nobody will say anything. But as soon as you step foot into a place, guess what happens? The atmosphere is thrown off. Why? Because you believe in Christ. That's why. Where somebody else may have forgotten, you did not. Where somebody else may be hung up on these argumentative details, you do not. Because many of you seek for another soul to be saved, and that makes you dangerous. Satan doesn't care if you read your Bible. He cares if you believe it. And to believe the Bible is to begin to walk by it. And if you don't believe that, commit yourself to walk in righteousness for one day and watch what happens. Not to say you're not walking in righteousness, but step it up a notch and watch what happens if you don't believe it. You watch what happens. You're going to be opposed so bad, you're going to say what happened. Some of you even know that if you follow through by faith, I mean absolute faith, some of you already know you're going to be opposed or something negative will take place. You already know that. And for some of you, it's frightened you away from walking in those absolute steps you know how to walk in. Because you know the breakdown will happen. You teachers out there, you, you folks that teach other people about the Word of God, you're supposed to have breakdowns, but you're never supposed to break down. Do you know that? You have to be trying that way. Why would God have somebody speak about the Word of God that can easily be overcome by evil? We're supposed to be assaulted and all these other things that come about, but we are not to be moved. I don't consider myself as any title of man to carry, but I certainly get those attacks, effective attacks. Because if I can shut up, you know, that would be good for some folks. For me not to talk at all. And you're likewise. Those of you who love to talk about the Lord, who believe that others, you know, that salvation is for everybody. He wants to shut you up. Never expect for taxes to And for those of you who have ministries, get ready for both barrels to be aimed at you. And the first minute you step into pride, or he's going to get you. He tries to make people compromise what they're going to say. Talk about specific things. Just don't talk about the gospel. His attacks are real, yes. But the Lord has already told us about it. And he said they would be amplified in the last days. In fact, in the last days, he told us that Satan would pursue the remnant of the woman, that woman being Israel. He'd pursue the remnant of her seed to kill her, to kill every seed he can. That's what he's after. He wants to destroy every seed of the living God. There are plagues on the way. There are plagues that have already begun. You think they're really going to talk about some of the real plagues they can't do anything about? Why announce anything that they cannot do anything about? What about some of the diseases that are happening right now that they like to call cancer? Cancer is running rampant all over the place. They don't talk about cancer because everybody accepts that as some common disease. That's not common. It's consuming too many lives. What about the children's diseases that are coming out? Newborns are dying all over the world. Oh, you didn't check that one yet, did you? What about a, a new type of schizophrenia causing people to just simply go into fits of rage? And in just about every case, they have the same explanation. I could not control myself. Like those two women that ran out into traffic got hit by a tractor trailer, got up and started laughing, and then attacked the people in the ambulance. But the sad part about that is they were Christians. They were in the church. Listen, these days that we're in are not days for acting apart, joking or playing and doing all that stuff. It's going to be for real. There are going to be real casualties. And when casualties become very real, too real, people are going to go back to those who handle the word and say, why didn't you warn us about that? Why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell us anything? Jesus certainly warned us. He sent prophet after prophet to warn us. But in today's world, man has this habit of reading the Bible by way of a convenience or something. They want their ears tickled. But just like at the beginning of this conversation, I was talking about Thessalonians and how the basis of Thessalonians is telling us to be prepared before the Lord arrives, to purge the evil before the Lord arrives, to align yourself before the Lord arrives. And then he tells us why. With that same overtone, in the first conversation I'm telling you now, there are some things you cannot buy your way to prepare for. You can buy all the bullets in the world. It's not going to help you. There are some physical things you have no defense against. If you do not have Christ, you'll have no defense. Then you notice in Revelation where men are tormented for five months. They're not to be killed, but tormented for five months. And it says in those days men will seek death, but will not find it. 
Everybody wants that to be way down the road, right? They don't want that to be immediate. But you know how people say, well, revelation is not in order. I'll tell you something. If revelation is not in order, then everybody has a problem right now. That smoke that comes out of the pit like smoke of a furnace and covers the sky, thick clouds and blackness, and stuff comes out of that pit to torment man for five months. Not to kill a person, not to kill a person, but to torment a person. You ever have that thought in your head that you wish you were dead because you didn't want to endure what you were going through? We may not admit it, but most of us have. Most of us have a few times. So imagine a torment no one can escape from. You know, there's some serious things we have to discuss. And they're not entertaining subjects because some of those things are already happening. You don't know about the unfortunate people who have befallen certain things. You don't know about them, but you will. I think you need to know because it's the truth. It's not hearsay either. This happens probably just about every week. Somebody is a victim of things. And they are not what you're used to. And they are multiplying. I'm not even worried about being called crazy because I already know part of the outcome. I'd care less if somebody would ever call me crazy. I don't mind the penguins because there's some serious preparations that need to be looked at. Just as the Lord said, he's given us warning of what would come. And if we fail to prepare, it's on us. Why would he even have me in a position to have knowledge of certain things and give me discernment to know what's beneficial and what's not? People, when they see pastors go through things, sometimes you have people say, well, they're cursed. They should have been following God better, this, that, and the other. Not understanding that in order to teach, in order to teach, God works in the realm of truth. So if somebody's going to be a teacher, how can they teach something they have no experience with? And be very difficult to do, right? God will qualify a thorough teacher, which means if a person teaches you something, but they themselves have not gone through it, that teaching is going to be empty. It's going to be very empty. Suppose I'd never gone through anything, and I said, well, guys, I'm going to teach you how to overcome a certain type of evil. Okay, that would be an effective fake. That would be for, you know, show only. Be no passion involved. And there would be none, no effect in your life. But with the Lord, he will qualify. And the Lord has you speak about something. You will go through it. So I've gone through quite a bit. I don't mind sharing my downfalls and mishaps and all these things, right? Because they were qualifications. That's why I get so passionate, especially with people when they start giving up on themselves. I work with a lot of suicide and people who are about to commit suicide. And uh, the only reason I'm effective in that is because I can understand where they're coming from. When you know what it is to be pushed aside, but you, but you could bear it. All sorts of things, but you could bear it. You're qualified to speak in certain subjects. And just like you guys, many of you have gone through things so you can be qualified to speak to others. The Lord empowers you that way. In my life, right? Sometimes things do fall apart in my life. You guys never know it because I never give up. Do you know why? Because I have experience with that. But if I did not have experience, my faith would be defeated. And I would sit back in a corner like Charlie Brown saying, well, it was me. I don't say that. Because I understand part of the process. I also know the Lord delivers. If somebody were to ever, ever tell me, I don't think God will deliver me. Oh boy, I'm going to pull up a chair. I'm going to have a sit down. I've done that before. Because I can't give up on a person who's losing faith. That's why we go through things. It increases our faith in certain areas so that when you're talking to somebody who's facing darkness, you can assist them when they're facing that darkness. You can actually face that darkness with them without falling apart. Paul, in a like manner, and the other apostles, for that matter, told everybody what they were about to go through. So they knew it. It was no big um, secret. But what he's saying here is that sometimes, because it happened in several places in the Bible, some people hear about your calamities, and they say, well, the devil got you. Kind of like Job's friends he said, Job, why don't you repent? You sinned somewhere, somehow, but we know he did not. They were giving Job advice on how to get back into the good graces of the Lord. And they were trying to tell him, well, you've sinned somewhere. You need, you, you got to change it. You don't have to be prideful and, and say that you didn't. But we know in truth, Job did not sin. We already know that. So likewise, teachers. The Lord said, if you're going to call yourself a teacher, understand that you're going to be judged seven times worse than anybody else. You, you, you're going to be judged at a pretty high standard with the Lord. You have to constantly go through things because you have to constantly be in touch with everybody else. That's why teachers go through what they go through. It shouldn't be strange for any pastor, teacher, bishop, whoever it is, to go through persecutions. That is part of being a teacher, pastor, or bishop. You're going to go through persecutions so that you're always in tune with the people. It shouldn't be strange to anybody like that. Let me continue. It says, but now this is 
1 Thessalonians 3, 6. But now Timothy is came from you unto us and bought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you on all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live. If ye stand fast in the Lord, right? He said, if you stand fast in the Lord, for what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all that joy wherewith we join for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct you, direct you our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Notice he did not say your deeds. He said your hearts, didn't he? To establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. Not just unblameable. He did not say to establish your hearts unblameable. He said to establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. That's very important. Your hearts, not your deeds. Do you know why? Because your body has reactions. Your body has these repetitive things that it will do or crave and all these different things. But change starts where? In your heart. And it leaks out from there. Whether it be good or bad, change starts in the heart. Many criminals will, after you talk to them a while, they'll let you know that they felt unloved and their hearts were broken. Criminals do that. And because their hearts were broken, they started not to care. And when they didn't care, it trickled out to their deeds. You take that same rotten person, you change the heart, guess what happens? They can't do those deeds anymore because there's a heart change. And that's why here in this it says that the end results of you may be that your hearts be unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the, listen, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Did you hear that? That's a mandate. He's giving you a goal here. He's giving you something here that most people don't even talk about. That God not find your hearts corrupted, but in fact blameless and bound in holiness. Your hearts. Why do you think it's so important to forgive someone? Why do you think you can't be forgiven if you don't forgive someone? Because that means something is wrong with your heart. The change begins in the heart and it trickles out from there. You speak what's in your heart. Most people say, well, you know, Mike, I have anger issues. Well, it's because something is in your heart. That's why. And it's triggered. Something will trigger you. Something that's close to you. Something else, possibly you took the blame for something that you felt you shouldn't have been blamed for. Nobody ever knew about it. You have harbored that ill will in your heart, that unfairness for so long that when something is close to it, you start speaking out of your heart. Out of the, out of the mouth comes the abundance of the heart. So whatever you're overflowing from in your heart, you're going to speak about it. And you will speak about the most. You can know yourself by the abundance of your own conversation. What do you like to talk about? I'll give you an example. I don't talk about other people. I don't like that. I, I just don't. So as a result of that, I'm constantly evaluating Mike and trying to help other people. But that wasn't always the case. I remember one time I got in this habit of joining in with the boys, talking about, you know, they would talk about somebody and laugh. One day I felt very uncomfortable laughing. And then it got back to the individual I laughed at. Do you know how rotten I felt? And I was young then. I felt rotten. Why did I feel rotten? Because it was, I, I got caught. Because I was laughing with everybody else who was talking about somebody. And word got back to him that I said, you know, I was laughing with the guys about him. And it put me in a very uncomfortable position. But why? Because that wasn't me. That was me going along with the boys. Anybody ever been like that? You get caught being complicit with the deeds of others. And then it gets back to the individual that you were complicit. And all of a sudden, guess what? You feel uncomfortable. See, if you were like that for real, it wouldn't bother you. If a person came back and said, I heard you talking about me. If you, if your heart was darkened or you were complicit with that, you would say so. If your heart's not like that and somebody comes back and they say that, you feel out of place. Why? Because you know it was not you. Consequently, you can know yourself that way too by what you're complicit with and what you're not complicit with. That means you don't want to break anybody's heart. That means you don't want to do any ill will against anybody. That's what that really means. But if somebody ever comes to you and they say, well, I, you talked about me. And they say, I sure did. And I'll do it to your face. And that person, they need, they have to have a heart change. 
because that's being very uh, cold in the heart. But for the most part, Christians will not do that. Sometimes they'll do it for grandstanding. I'm, I've heard people do that. But for the most part, people feel bad when it comes around. And, and ironically, it doesn't matter how bad you think the person is. If they, in fact, are marked for salvation, they're going to be convicted by such things. And if you like you, the person, though, you don't belong with that group of people. That's not you. That's outside of your normal parameters, your normal behavior. Let's continue with Thessalonians. We're running out of time here. I'm going to go to four immediately. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, to exhort you by our Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For you know what commandments was gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Folks, I'm giving you a task list here. You normally don't hear this in conversation about Thessalonians, right? But this is what we are to do prior to Christ coming back. It also, if you can seal up these breaches, fornication is a breach. Living in sanctification and honor of your own vessel, learning how to preserve your vessel in sanctification and honor is a defense. Satan can easily come through fornication. Satan can easily compromise you through fornication. So what does that mean for all these people that are dating? You've got a choice to make. You can always set things right and do things honorable, but you have to make a choice. A lot of people say, well, that's a hard choice. Well, good, because the harder it is, the better it is. Because you're not just anyone. You're not to end up some statistic. But these things we ought to have handled before the Lord comes back. You remember what Paul said, likewise, no liar, no fornicator. They're not going to enter in. No adulteress is going to enter into the kingdom of God. Oh, boy. So that means when the Lord comes back, if he finds us in these sins, we're not going with it. Now, we've been blessed with time to get these things right. See, it's easier to tell somebody, hey, no matter what you're doing, if you love the Lord, you're going to make it. But that's not what the Lord says. That's not what he says. I know I know that's what the world teaches. I know that's what people try to teach us. That's not the way it is. That's just not the way it is. Listen, that every one of you should know how to possess this vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond the defraud to de- and ber- defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Folks, 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 do not defraud your brother in any matter. Now, for the most part, it can be received different ways, right? Don't have a heart to defraud your brother, no matter how desperate you become. And that means, because every time this is read, and sometimes people take it lightly, please don't take it lightly, but meditate on it. Ask the Lord to help you with it. Never brag about it, because you'll have to be tried. Let me tell you what being tried about this is. Suppose one month you're doing okay, but the next month everything falls apart. But you've got a friend who has money. Now, you're supposed to be bound in righteousness and holiness. But suppose you make up some wild excuse why you need some money. In truth, you need it for desperation to pay those bills. But you make up some other cause. You're defrauding your brother, even if it's a minor cause. Even if you say, well, you know, my engine's not working right. And, you know, but in truth, your rent has to be paid. That's still defrauding your brother. You're misguiding your brother. That way. You can't do that. Because listen, it says, let no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified. See, they testified to this. There's a reason why. And it's meat, but there's a reason why. So they know this for real. Don't do it in any way. That means a lot of you, you host, you host uh, Bible studies, you're doing things for the Lord. It's the reason I don't get into the money thing. That's the main reason. I don't get into the money thing. You start getting into the money thing, and all of a sudden you set some standard. And it, do you need money to operate stuff like this? Of course you do. Well, everybody knows that. But I don't get into it. I'd rather go broke than be put in position. To ever have to misspeak or do something else that wasn't quite right? No, not doing that. Especially with money. Especially with money. Because that's where most people end up going south. That's where good people have gone south. And it doesn't matter if people find out. It doesn't matter if it was half close to the truth. Because God can see the truth of it all. And that's just me. Don't expect that from everybody. I just can't allow that because of the diversity of this place and what we actually are about to soon start talking about. 
Indeed. Money is the money says money is a tool. Yes, it most certainly is a tool. And that that is, I just, you know, that's a very dangerous area. Even with your own families. It doesn't matter how small the amount is, how big the amount is. I knew a guy, he had been running around with guilt for many years until he came back to me. And the guilt had eaten him up. And he gave his life to Christ because he misused funds I gave him, right? He was supposed to handle one thing, but he didn't. He didn't. And it ate him up on the inside. For years, he had to live with that. Now, he did give his life to Christ. He came back and told me that it ate him up from the end. I was very thankful for that. But I was also saddened that it, it took that, that that happened. I can't stand that. I really can't stand that. Probably why I don't have much, but I can't stand that. It causes too much junk, and I like to keep that junk out of this place. That's why I like people to do things by the spirit, right? That's why I can never really let you know if we're in a bad struggle or not. I really can't do that. I have conviction over that. I want to sometimes, but I can't do it. All right, let's continue. So it says, after this one now, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. So all that's bound in uncleanness. It's bound in uncleanness. All that defrauding and everything else. And well, here's what's really bad about any type of fraudulent or defrauding anybody. Is that if you do it and get away with it, you can do it again and get away with it. Until you reach a point where you're just like the world. They do it every single day. And because they get away with it, to them it's no longer a sinful thing. Then they become mindless behind it. And they're not regarding another person while they're doing it. Look at half these guys. You see it every single day. And I know a lot of people disagree with me, but you see it every day. These guys do rotten things when they're in positions of power. I'm telling you right now, they do the most rotten things you'd ever see. And they have no nothing behind it because they practiced it too much. They become blind to it. It's just like, um, I'm not against anybody smoking or anything, right? But a person who smokes, maybe they had conviction the first time, first two times, first two packs, first part. All of a sudden, it gets down the road. They don't mind it at all. But at first, they said, I shouldn't do this. And then they don't mind it. They stop feeling it. Look at cursing. You have people that, you know, maybe they say a couple of those colorful words here and there. Get down the road, and it becomes a natural reaction to the point where they say, well, you know, the Lord will have to forgive me. I just had to say it. Because now there's no conviction associated with the deed. Now the person can't even see that it's causing uncleanness within them. And the Bible does say, let no guile come out of our mouths. We're to have no cursing in our mouths. That's what the word says. And these areas we're supposed to be working in. Those small little tiny things, they turn into big things. This I know, the small things, it's just like that. Any bad habit you mention, nobody ever said, I'm going to grow up to be a, the most terrible guy on the planet. Somebody said defrauding, question mark, meaning cheating people with money? No, not always with money. Defrauding is, is a, when you defraud someone, you're presenting something under the guise of something else. That can, go, that can be with money, with people. That can be with anything. It's not necessarily about the money. It weighs heavily on me with money because of the world. Because of what the world does. The world is something else. He said, but I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Did you hear that? Those who sorrow for those who are asleep or those who have no hope. That's a very revealing statement. He said, for if we believe that Jesus did die and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? I find that interesting. That answers quite a bit. God will bring them with him. For this we say unto you, that the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Listen, those who are alive and remain when the Lord comes shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. He said, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. If that is kept in context, that is a great encouragement. At the beginning of this conversation, we talked about the vision concerning the same subject, which shouldn't be. But what words are we to encourage each other by? The whole thing, not half of it. Did you hear me? The whole thing. We can't just say the Lord's coming and everybody who's alive at that time is going with him in the air because that's a lie. He just talked about being in holiness. He just talked about abstaining from fornication. He just talked about not defrauding your brother. He just talked about studying to be quiet, to do your own business. He just talked about all these things and all of those things. They will bring us hope that if you're working hard, diligently, 
to walk in holiness is for a great cause, not an empty cause. And when the Lord comes back, you will go with him because you're truly one of his. But if you don't do the first half, you can forget about this last half. If, if a person is set up there, they're in fornication. They're not a holy vessel. They're not even striving to be a holy vessel. They can forget about the last part. When the Lord comes back, he's going to be their nightmare. So the whole thing must be in context. We can't pick out the last half, get everybody excited like you can live like hell on earth and still go be with the Lord at the end. It's not going to work that way. There's some things we have to work on. And he is faithful that if we get these areas right, he would never, you know what, the Lord would never request of us what we cannot do. Remember that. Remember, he's not some crooked lawyer, right? That's what lawyers do. That's what, that's what corporate bosses sometimes do to get you fired. They'll ask you to do something you have no ability to do, to demean you, to fire you, whatever the case is. The Lord's not like that. So anything he requested of us, he's already empowered us to get it done. And before it's too late, we need to get it done. Can you now see how we have just enough time? We don't have time to sit back and relax, kick our feet up like we've conquered all evil. We have not. That's why we're still here. The day I overcome all darkness is the day I'm gone. Do you guys know that? Do you know even Paul still had areas he had to work on? Peter had areas he had to work on. Do you know that? So long as we have areas we have to work on. We're not work with when we finish our race, then we have conquered all. Until we finish our race, we have not conquered. And we could be in trouble. In fact, by the Spirit I'll say that the Lord has given each of you something. It does not come every day, nor every week, nor every month, but it still comes. There's something you have to do in your life. Well, the Lord has communicated to you that if you fail to do this, you will not go with him, whatever that is. I don't know what it is. It's not for me to know. It's for you to know. It comes up maybe once a year, and nobody likes the reminder. Anybody ever have one of those times? It comes in crystal clear. You're thinking about it. You say, oh, i got to put that out of my mind. I, I know i got to handle that. But it's something you don't even want to look at at the moment. And we know that if we don't do that thing, we're done for. So we have a lot to work on, don't we, in all honesty? We have some things we have to work on. We have to get it right. It's time for us to truly walk in faith. Not celebrating before we have put any effort towards anything, but to continue to work out our salvation and to assist each other in doing it. Not to have division over arguments with scriptural divides that are meaningless. No, no. We have things to work out in our own lives. Can you see how I cannot evaluate your life? I can't do that. I have to be careful to work out everything in my life. I'm here to assist in areas that I can assist in. That's what I'm here. But I'm also here to make sure that I'm walking out these things in my own life. And if you're a teacher again, the Lord will have you walk out much so that you can assist many. Don't demean yourselves because you're going through a lot. If you're designated as a teacher from the Most High, you're going to go through a lot. A pastor, you're going to go through a lot. You've got to know how to care for people. A pastor is a master servant in COT vocabulary. The greatest leader on earth had to be the greatest servant to mankind. That's what a true leader is, a servant. It's nothing like today. A leader is not somebody who gets all the praise. A leader is somebody who knows how to serve everybody. That's what a leader is. For some reason, things are backward in these days. They're, they're really backward. But I know that the Lord has given all of us an ability to do it. There are things coming, things forming, yes. They are deadly, yes. They're going to change everything we ever thought we knew about life, yes. But the Lord has empowered us now in this moment to do what is necessary, to be prepared for his arrival. See, knowing this kind of changes things. You don't want him to come back tonight because something may be undone and you won't go with him. All those things people have left undone, yet they're saying, I want the Lord to come back tonight. That's kind of a prideful statement, isn't it? No wonder the word says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because you never know if something is forgotten. We can do this in truth. And this is good to know before we start those subjects. But the breakdown and fallout this world is uh, starting to experience. But I said the devil is trying to attack someone in their dreams. Is that your kids? I miss that. I used to have bad dreams. A lot. Until I found out those bad dreams prepared me to stand up in war. They did. Parents, what you can do is this. If you're a parent, God gave you responsibility over those children. Instead of being the parent where you own the children, let the Lord know that now you know those children belong to him. That you've been given responsibility over those children. That you would like help in raising those children his way. In other words, when you pray for your children, make sure you stay within the realm of truth. Because those kids don't belong to you, mothers and dads. They don't belong to you. They belong to the Lord. 
The Lord saw fit for you to raise them because of what you've been through. That's a privilege. Because in the end, those are going to be your brothers and your sisters. Your own children are going to be your brothers and your sisters. You've been given a massive responsibility to raise them, to teach them the way that they should go. So teach them. And let the Lord know that now you know they belong to Him. Never try to own the children. Because they truly don't belong to us. God has just seen fit to give us charge over them for a little while. That's all. Oh, and one great thing is it doesn't matter how old they are. You're still a parent so long as you have life and they have life. Always pray for your children. But always let the Lord know the gift he's giving you by way of those kids. You want to be filled up with knowledge? You know how when you're praying and you don't have the right words to say, he'll give you exactly what to say. He'll give you the right sentence that can cause a diminished child, even if they're a hundred, to have hope again. That will come from Christ. All it requires is for us to enter into truth with the Lord. The Lord's always found in truth. He's never found in falsehoods, always in the truth.